And we're live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Talking Live with Macy. I, I believe that all of you might have been waiting, so I hope all of you are actually um, uh, joining in today. I see a lot of you sharing, and we're going to wait for 15 people, 15 people to join the stream before I start off with the introduction because I don't want any of you to miss out on it. this. So if you're watching this, uh, what I would like to encourage you to do right now is share this stream so that your friends and family are aware they can get and join us immediately and ask questions. I think this is the best time to come and ask questions and uh, find out about this new scientific discovery that we're going to talk about. So um, looks like the meter has jumped to 14. Uh, let's get a few more people to join before I officially begin the introduction to today's very exciting topic. Please do share this with your friends, with your family, with your community, because we are trying to create as much awareness as possible. Well, more than 15 people have joined and it's quite quick. So it looks like everyone's very excited for today's topic. Welcome to Talking Live with Macy. And um, since the C we've transitioned into CMCO, I know everyone's busy. I have been extremely busy too. So please stay safe, practice the SOPs. And for those of you who are joining in today, um, please share this with your friends and family. And also, I would suggest that you start putting in your questions now so we can pick them up at the end. Um, I know last week I managed, I actually missed out quite a few of your questions. So I'm sorry about that. So please put in now so we don't miss it out today. And um, good afternoon to all of you. I see all of you saying hi. Um, all right, so let me introduce today's topic to all of you. I believe that I've mentioned a lot about colorectal cancer awareness, and this is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. This is the final episode of a three-part series on Talking Life with Macy. It is not a much hyped about cancer um, because I believe it's about the colon and rectum. And I've mentioned previously that colorectal cancer is the most common cancer amongst men in Malaysia and second most common cancer amongst females in Malaysia. So everyone knows about our immune system, the function, what it does for our bodies and what role it plays. But no one talks about the research about its role for colorectal cancer patients. As you guys know, I'm a rectal cancer survivor and um, Actually, today we're going to find out more about a new scientific method that helps increase prognostic values for early stage colorectal cancer patients. I'm an early stage rectal cancer patient, so stage 2B, and um, I'm very excited when I found out about it. So it also helps with treatment planning for those who are battling colorectal cancer. Today, when we talk about immune system, we're not just going to talk about colorectal cancer uh, per se, but actually we're going to talk about how the immune system plays a total role in uh, cancer. So I think uh, we have, I'm so excited and honored to have Dr. John Lowe, a consultant oncologist from Pantai Medical here with us today. Um, he took, he's, uh, he's very, very busy. I'm so excited to have him on board to help us share with the, us about this new scientific discovery, especially for early stage colorectal cancer patients. So thank you so much, Dr. John, for joining us, for being so gracious with your time and um, being a part of Talking Life with Macy. Hi, thank Dr. You. John. Hi. <laughs> So, Dr. John, how um, I'm going to just jump straight into the questions because I think people are going to start having questions for you. So, I will ask the first question first. Uh, according to reliable sources, colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer here in Malaysia and the third leading cause of cancer death. However, most patients sought treatment for cancer only when they are already in later stages due to lack of awareness, which we all know. And I've also mentioned. So what do you think about it? Is that true? Well, I think it's, uh, especially in, in, in Malaysia, in our local setting, I, I think it's, uh, it's quite true. And uh, the reason is that I think the, some of the symptoms, especially when you talk about colorectal cancer, they are actually not very specific sometimes, and uh, they may just have some, just uh, in the very beginning some abdominal discomfort, distension, or you know change of bowel habits that a lot of the patients may actually actually attribute it to just uh, you know some uh, gastroenteritis, 
uh, they take some uh, you know, food that cause some food poisoning and all that. And even when they have some bleeding per rector, they may attribute it to uh, pulse, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, then ignore it. And uh, only when it keeps uh, recurring, that's when they start to seek advice and, and uh, treatment. And a lot of times that may be actually presenting at the later stage. So that's probably one of the, the, the contributing factor why uh, a lot of patients presented late. And lack of awareness is definitely one of them. And fear as well. I think a lot of patients mm -hmm. are afraid that uh, you know, it may turn out to be cancer then, and thinking that better not know because if I know, then I will have to go through a lot of you know, probably suffering and all that. And, and uh, so that's a lot of uh, fear and anxiety and uh, lack of awareness. And that, that actually contributed to a lot of patients presenting at the later stage. Okay, I see. So um, I think the fear is because of the lack of awareness of treatment and uh, what it could possibly be. It might not, it might actually be hemorrhoids, but um, if it actually is cancer, it's better detected earlier. So yeah. I, I want um, actually every one of you watching this, please share this with your friends, with your family, with your community, so we can continuously raise awareness about colorectal cancer or cancers about the stomach. So please do it now. And also for those of you who have questions, once again, um, I ask you to put it in now so there won't be any backlog lock of questions after this. Now, Dr. John, my next question is, I think a lot of people are confused. What is colorectal cancer? People keep thinking it's just colon cancer. So are both colon and rectal cancer the same? Perhaps you can uh, tell us more about that. Well, I, well, it's it's uh, basically the, the colorectal is the scientific name for the large intestine. So you have the small intestine, you know, when you swallow, it goes through your esophagus all the way down your stomach. And then you have the small in that intestine about five meters or so. Then that's when you join to your large intestine. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the adult, the length is probably about uh, 150 centimeter. And then the last part of the, the, the rectum, uh, the, the colon is actually the rectum. It's about 15, 10 to 15 centimeters in an adult. So it's actually a continuation. So when we talk about colon cancer, we're actually referring to colorectal cancer in general. All right. So I that's the, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So they, okay. they kind of share the same etiology, uh, the same risk profile and, and all that. So treatment is probably a little bit different in terms of the location of the cancer. And the prognosis is different as well between the left-sided and the right-sided colon and the rectum as well. But it is grouped as one uh, uh, site, which is colorectal. Mm. Yep. Okay, but it's, uh, for easier understanding, it's basically in the same track, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a continuation. So ba yeah. basically, you know the large intestine, the function, it's basically the absorptions of uh, uh, mainly water, you know, and then concentrating the bowel so that you can stall in your rectum, you know, before you, you okay. go for evacuation. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for explaining that. So now cancer happens when cells uh, that are not normal spread very fast. Normal body cells grow and divide and they know when to stop growing. Over time, they also die. But unlike these normal cells, cancer cells just continue to grow, divide out of control, mutate, and they don't die when they're supposed to. So what is our body doing, doing during this stage? And is there a role for the immune system in cancer? Well, definitely the immune system, it's uh, very, very important uh, in prevention and, uh, of cancer. We know that there are many hallmarks of cancer. Uh, the last we counted is probably about seven of them. And one of the hallmarks of cancer is evasion of the immune system. So basically, the, the cancer learn and trick the body such that they actually evade the immune cells in the body. And that's how they, they grow and divide. And then they can then metastasize and all that because they kind of like uh, trick the body to tell the body that we are good cells. One of the ways that they do it is switch off our, our immune response uh, to, to identify them and then they thrive. So the immune response is very important in the normal scenario. If your immune system is strong and working well, you know, you actually get rid of a lot of cells that become renegades. 
in, in the body because mutation happens all the time, just like what you have mentioned, uh, Mason. So in, in that scenario, they can become bad cells and then your, your immune uh, system will detect them and attack them and get rid of them. You know, but then cancers can actually use this same um, you know, way of your the immune system as well to shut it down because you know that there's this condition where if you if your immune system go haywire, it can cause autoimmune disorder. Mm. All right. So in the system itself, we have underlying breaks in our system that try to stop the immune response from attacking the good cells. And cancers actually use that same breaks and stop the immune system from, from hitting them. So now a lot of drugs is in that line of development and has been very successful to actually harness our own immune response to attack can cancers. So very, a lot of success stories, um, especially in lung cancer. So we have mm. seen remarkable response in uh, all these new drugs mm. that harness our own immune response to, to attack the cancer. So immune system, very, very important. Uh, you know, without that, uh, you know, everyone will be getting cancer every day. So our immune system is, is very, very important. I think um, the question many people would have is, how do we fortify our immune system? What we are doing currently is like, you know, working out, eating as clean as possible. And also a lot of people think supplements uh, help a lot. So I, I know this is a bit off topic, but is this how we fortify our immune system? Well, I think a, a proper nutrition, you know, uh, ample rest, uh, you know, uh, and all that, it's absolutely vital, you know, for a, for a healthy uh, body system to function and all that. But, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, underlying uh, problems to the immune system, you know, sometimes it's beyond our control because it can be sometimes genetically linked or it can be because of the cancer itself because when they keep mutating, they just acquire different characteristics and one of the way for them to grow and all that is to develop that, uh, you know, pathway and block that pathway and that particular enzymes and proteins and, and just mutate, you know. So I don't think it's just such a simple thing of uh, having a healthy diet and all that. Those are important because in the preventive stage, if you have a good system of a strong immune response, you know, you can definitely protect your, your system from the under attack. And we do know that some viruses and, and all that can actually cause cancer. And if you have a strong system, you know, potentially it can be a deterrence. So absolutely important. I think a uh, balanced, healthy diet uh, and, and all that plays a very important role in cancer prevention. All right. Thanks, Dr. John, for um, answering my question. Uh, so, so there is this new technology uh, being introduced for the first time uh, regarding the immune response as essential and desirable diagnostic criteria for colorectal cancer. So could you share more about how it works? This is the new discovery that I mentioned earlier, guys. So Dr. John has more info on it and he's going to share with us. Okay. So basically, the, as we, we discussed previously, we know how important the immune response is. And we also know how important that the, the immune cells attack the cancers. So what we found out, in, especially in colorectal cancer, uh, when we actually cut out the specimen of the tumor and you look at it under the microscope, and uh, it's not just peculiar to colorectal cancer, but uh, more so in this scenario, because today we are talking about colorectal cancer. We actually see a lot of immune cells in the vicinity of the cancer, even within the cancer itself, in the center of the tumor, and also in the invasive margins of the tumor. Basically, the immune system is trying to stop this cancer from growing. And what studies have shown is that if you have a lot of these immune cells, within the cancer and the vicinity of the cancer, those patients tend to do better. And uh, now what happened is that it, it, a new scoring system, basically a, 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 they call it a digital pathology. They look at the, the specimen, looking at the number of immunocells in the cancer and from there develop a score to let us know, basically to prognosticate and to tell us in, in terms of predicting how well this patient is going to do. And uh, so there are a lot of studies that is uh, are still ongoing, but there are early results and in a large number of cohort of colorectal cancer patients um, showing that this immunoscore can actually predict. And if you have a high immunoscore, meaning that there are a lot of white blood cells, uh, T cells, we call it uh, T cells within that vicinity, 
and, and stain four, you've got a high immunoscore, those patients actually, uh, they do very well. And then you have a lower score, but cancer tends to come back earlier. And they also predict for the successfulness of chemotherapy and uh, how well the chemotherapy will work. And in terms of uh, rectal cancer, it also predicts uh, how well in terms of your radiotherapy and uh, oral chemotherapy or other chemotherapy has a chance of uh, completely uh, uh, eradicating the disease. So this is a very exciting area. And in fact, uh, it may be actually roll on to other cancer sites as well. But uh, it, it is now, uh, you know, one of the things that we may actually be able to, to use to further uh, tailor the treatment for colorectal cancer patients by using this scoring system. So um, currently, it uh, basically, it helps with treatment planning for those currently having colon and rectal CA, right? And, or uh, it is after. But I, I believe you mentioned that it helps with understanding the treatment plan for chemotherapy and oral th chemotherapy as well. Yes. So basically, I mean, traditionally, where we treat cancer, even, even I mean, the current situation, we look at the stage of the disease, i.e., you know, whether it's stage one, yeah. stage two, and so on and so forth. And we look at some other characteristic of the cancer, uh, how aggressive it is in terms of the grade, basically, this, uh, this cancer, is it growing very fast or is it a slow growing? Uh, you know, basically the pathologists look under the microscope, they can give a grading for us. The higher the grade, the more aggressive it is. We also look for other things like whether there is any cancer within the vicinity of the blood vessels and also the lymphatic system, we call it lymphovascular invasion. Mm -hmm. So you have those means that the cancer has a higher chance of spreading elsewhere. We also look for uh, whether the cancer has tracked along the nervous system called perineural invasion, all right, and also the depth of the cancer, all these things and, and the type of the cancer. So even in colorectal cancer, you can have different type of cancer. Certain, certain cancers are more aggressive than others. So all this uh, uh, tells the oncologist or the treating doctor, what should we do? You know, uh, for example, colorectal cancer after surgery, do, do we need to give this patient chemotherapy? So these are the basic things that we look at. But now we have an addition to this in colorectal mm -hmm. cancer to look at the immune score, basically how much white blood cells are infiltrating this cancer, mm -hmm. giving a scoring and can potentially tell us what else we need to do. So if they have a very high score and they are borderline and we do not know whether we should give them uh, treatment or not, and then this may tip us to the fact if they have a very low score and say, yeah, this is high risk, we have mm. to treat. Or they have a higher risk, but a stage three disease, but other features telling us that, hey, we may not need to give these patients uh, a chemotherapy because the tumor is small, although there are one or two lymph nodes affected. Then this immunoscore may come back and tell us that it is very high. And we know that this prognosis is good and we may not need to give chemo. So this is some of the things that uh, uh, it's uh, you know slowly being accepted. This is still new, but uh, the data seems to be uh, suggesting that this is what one way and one direction to go. In fact, WHO has actually incorporated this scoring system into their staging manual. So I think it's something that uh, in the future, a lot of colorectal cancer patients will ask for and a lot of oncologists will recommend on top of the normal staging system. That's that's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. So I actually just sent my tissue, my tumor tissue for scoring. I'm an early stage rectal cancer patient uh, previously. So I'm pretty excited or rather a bit nervous to see the results. I hope yep. I get high immuno score. <laughs> um, so um, Dr. John, who can benefit from immuno score currently? Okay. I think the, 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 the you know, we are to talk about colon cancer and rectal cancer. They are treated quite differently. So especially, let's switch gear a bit and look, about, look at rectal cancer. So like, rec rectal cancer presents a different problem. So especially those cancers that are lower down in the, in the, in the, in the pelvis, very close to the anus. So one of the things that we always concern about is that whether this patient will end up with a, a permanent colostomy, basically a permanent bag for life, which will affect their quality of life for the rest of their life, huh? basically. So we will try to <laughs> uh, we will try to avoid that 
And one of the ways to avoid it is to give radiotherapy and chemotherapy to this group of patients. And there are chances that this tumor may shrink and uh, so that the distance is far away, further away from the anus, and we can save the anus sprinter so they do not need to have the, the back. The other thing that we want to do sometimes is to completely eradicate it, especially those that are very close to the anus. If they go for surgery, they will definitely need to, to sacrifice the inner canal. So in those uh, situations, uh, after chemo radi radiation, they probably have about a 20, 25% chance of a complete response, meaning that the tumor disappear completely. But how do we predict that? You know, uh, no, is it just based on the stage? We know that that's not very accurate. So now with this new scoring system, uh, early results have shown that um, if you have a high immuno score uh, after the chemo radiation uh, and the tumor completely disappear, there's a very high chance that you do not need further surgery. Okay, because even those patients that completely disappear, you know, when you can't feel anything after the radiation, there's still a 50% chance there may still be cancer there. All right, so we may miss uh, the, the, some patients if we do not go for surgery. But with this immunoscore coming in, can we use that to predict, uh, you know, the, the, this group of patients such that they do not need surgery after that? So that's something that it, it, it is very interesting that uh, a lot of early data seem to suggest that. And our, our site as well is trying to run something akin to this study to, to see whether we can use this score uh, for this uh, rectal patients group. So, of course, in colon cancer, the immunoscore, as I mentioned previously, is to predict those patients with stage 2 disease. Uh, basically, stage 2 means that there's no lymph nodes involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, they are limited to the, to, the, to the colon alone. But there are certain features that uh, are high risk that uh, you know, we do not know whether this group of patients can avoid chemo or not. For example, if they have uh, invasion into the vessels and the lymphatic channel, we call it LVSI, or they're high grade, uh, or they, the tumor has perforated, means that they actually uh, have gone all the way through. Okay, And this group of patients, the risk is higher, but can we avoid giving chemotherapy? So that if the immunoscore comes in and you know that it's been validated, if it's high, then we can be have more confidence to, to suggest to our patients, yeah, in this scenario, we probably can watch you rather than give you chemo. So it potentially it can avoid a lot of over-treatment mm. rather than giving everyone chemotherapy if they have those risk factors. And then for the stage 3 cancer, very interestingly, we are trying actually to cut down on chemotherapy. So studies have shown that uh, patients with very small numbers of lymph node involvement, just one or two, you can actually give them three months of chemo rather than six months of chemo, correct? But these are all just based on clinical data. But we have shown that in immunoscore, these studies have shown that if the immunoscore is high, they actually benefit more from chemotherapy. So even if they have just one or two lymph nodes, if they come back as immunoscore high, we should actually give them chemo for six months and they continue to, to have uh, benefits. So all this immunoscore, besides telling us, uh, you know, to give more or don't give chemo, you also tell us in which group of uh, patients we actually give them more chemotherapy. Mm. So it's very interesting. So I think yeah. it's, it's something that we, we, we uh, you know, I think that it will be, uh, you know, incorporated into other tumor sites as well uh, in, in the future. Yeah. That's, that's very groundbreaking. And it's good to know that it will be incorporated to other uh, tumor sites. It, it helps very a lot with big. prognosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and treatment planning. So uh, what is the impact of immunoscore bringing to colon and rectal cancer? Does it help with understanding and generally just basically deciding treatment for the patients? Well, I think the, the score, this scoring system is still very new. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's uh, just recently been uh, in the market and uh, for commercial use. So I think uh, we, we, we still do not have a very uh, strong uh, data uh, to, to, to tell you that this, everyone needs immunoscore. Okay, definitely is uh, something that can help the physician, uh, but uh, this will, uh, we have talked into a lot of other issues in, you know, in terms of uh, costs and all that uh, into consideration. So I don't think that uh, you know, we will routinely recommend immunoscore for everyone, 
all right but in those scenario where where especially in this scenario like a stage two cancer and we really think that chemo may be able to be avoided but we are still a little bit worried and this may be something very good to be to be considered and the other scenario like those patients who have a complete response after radiotherapy for rectal cancer and they really do not want surgery because they will end up with a permanent colostomy then mm -hmm. we may say oh let's do this immunoscore and you have a high score uh, you can probably sleep better at night knowing that the chance of it recurring will be much less so i think these are the scenario that i think may be quite useful in colorectal cancer at least uh, and in, in for the time being until we have more data uh, coming mm -hmm. up yeah so Dr. John, you mentioned that uh, it's new to Malaysia. So where can people get Immunoscore? Well, I think the it's uh, I think it's currently available. So I think you can ask your doctor about it and uh, they will definitely contact the vendor. And then the, it's just a test on the cancer that has been taken out either from the mm. biopsy specimen or from your surgical specimen. Yeah. Okay, so um, if uh is there any trial ongoing at the moment anywhere well uh well i think there are trials but there are many many trials so it's very very hard to to elaborate every one of them uh, looking at okay. different, different scenario and validating the immunoscore so they're trying to incorporate this into uh, uh you know various uh, clinical scenario and trying to answer specific questions so i think this is a very useful scoring system and uh, it's an addition to what we are really doing, basically staging the disease, looking at uh, the, the uh, pathological characteristics, you know, the molecular characteristics and all that. This is just an addition to it. I see. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. John. Guys, if you have more questions about immunoscore score or any trials, please reach out to Dr. John from Pantai Hospital KL. Uh, for further inquiries and assistance. But now I'm going to take questions from all of you. So Dr. John, I'll just get questions from the audience now because there's quite a few of them. So uh, <laughs> Ms. Lee asks uh, whether shrimp and prawns are bad for cancer patients. <laughs> well, I, I think, okay. I think it's, uh, no, that seafood is good. I think it's nice. It's, it's healthy. It's got lots of proteins and, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, I know, but if you take excessive amount of it, then you you may have other problems like cholesterol, high cholesterol, and all that. But I don't. But definitely, shrimps and all that doesn't cause cancer. Uh, we do not have data to say that you take shrimps you get cancer, uh, unless uh, you have uh, if you're allergic to cancer and seafood. Then I mean to 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 shrimp and seafood and all that. Definitely, you should avoid them. But I see no reason why you shouldn't be taking uh, seafood and shrimp and 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 all that. You know? but everything in moderation, yeah. Yeah, I agree uh, about that. So um, this person asks if he or she has been diagnosed with colorectal cancer, what kind of doctor should she see first, a surgeon or an oncologist? Okay, I think if you have, uh, okay, you should be seeing your, your, your family doctor probably because if you have a, a symptom of pain, you probably present with something, abdominal pain, uh, bleeding or whatever, I, I think, it should be seeing your 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 family doctor, your someone that you is familiar with you, and you've been seeing you know, uh, you know all the time, and then they can pick this up and say, oh you got this thing, I don't think it's right, we'll refer you somewhere. So a lot of times they will be referred to either the gastroenterologist, or mm -hmm. the colorectal surgeon or a general surgeon because it depends on what they they suspect it to be. All right, so if they think yes. this this patient needs the scope then they may refer to a gastroenterologist. So that's usually the first port of call. I think it should be your family doctor. And then from there, move on to an, uh, another specialist that looks specifically at your problems. And I think you should not go straight to the oncologist because you may not have a cancer. All right. So from there, then once you get a cancer or whatever, then we can discuss about it. Usually your, can your, your surgeons will then uh, refer you to uh, uh, your oncologist if you need to see one. So I think that is usually the flow. All right. So, yeah. Mm, yep. I saw a gastro first, and then surgeon, then oncologist. Exactly. So, that's yeah. uh, the the onco and the surgeon. After that, uh, sort of like worked came hand in hand. Yes. Yeah, so, sure. so uh, for example, in 
in Pantai and also in Sanway, the other hospital I'm working, we do have this tumor board where, where we, we gather, uh, you know, especially those patients with some very challenging uh, uh, treatment uh, you know, decision. We actually meet regularly uh, every week to discuss. So, so cancer treatment is not a one-man show. It, it, we need a lot of support, not just from the doctors, but also from our ancillary uh, and the healthcare workers and everyone. So we bring everyone together, uh, you know, and our pathologists, our radiologists, our surgeons, our our uh, uh, physiotherapists, uh, our palliative physician. Everyone works together, and we discuss. So that's the way it works, and that's the way we can give the best care for our patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Dr. John. So, Ms. Saw asked, what is the treatment for colorectal cancer? You mentioned chemotherapy, radiotherapy, but she asked also, can the patient not opt for surgery? Okay, I mean, the, the, the curative treatment for colorectal cancer, unfortunately, or fortunately, is still surgery. Surgery is the main cure. So, if you have early stage disease, stage one, stage two, stage three, surgery, if it can be done, we should perform surgery. In special situation, unless you've got a small tumor very close to the anus, where we try to avoid giving a permanent colostomy for the patient, we, we, we may be able to avoid surgery if they have a complete response, means that cancer completely disappear after chemo and radio. In any other scenario, early stage one, two, or even stage three, surgery should be performed. Okay, we should not avoid surgery because it's curative. We want to cure the patient. Mm -hmm. But in a stage four scenario, when the cancer already spread and metastasized, we know that majority of the time it's very hard to cure the patient. So we are talking mainly about quality of life. And also we know that there's no point taking out the cancer when the cancer is already in your liver or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's when chemotherapy comes in and it's the most important treatment. And we will only do surgery uh, if it's necessary. For example, if a patient is bleeding and we cannot control it, or the patient is obstructed, they can't eat, they cannot pass motion, we may then do a surgery to bypass it or, or a stoma and all that. But the main treatment in that scenario will be chemotherapy. All right. So, okay. it, so it depends on the stage, the patient's presentation. So I mean, in short, we do not want to, to, to not give surgery because that is the most important uh, treatment that can cure the patient. Mm. Thank you. Um, Sansan asked, uh, because you mentioned about pulse, so she asked if there's a concern about pulse, whether she should remove it or not. Well, I mean, I mean, pulse is very common. I think all, everyone has it. Uh, and the uh, majority of the time, you, you may not need surgery. Some conservative treatment will, will solve it in some medical uh, treatment. Uh, but if it's very, very uh, bad and recurring and uh, bleeding heavily and painful, then you may have to consider surgery. Mm. So there are two quest uh, two people with the same questions, somewhat related, uh, Yvonne and Sansan. They asked about autoimmune system, autoimmune diseases. Does it increase the risk of getting cancer? Uh, there is no increased risk uh, of uh, uh, patients with autoimmune disorder getting cancer. Uh, but patients with autoimmune disease, like for example, SLE, okay, systemic lupus uh, uh, condition, mm -hmm. and others like rheumatoid arthritis and all that, they tend to, to take a lot of steroids sometimes. And or some, some of those, uh, some of these patients may also be getting other, other drugs that can suppress the immune response. And that indirectly may increase the risk. Okay, but having autoimmune disease per se doesn't increase the chance of getting cancer for the patients. Uh, uh, so um, this is uh, what we know. Uh, but if you have certain condition like Crohn's disease, uh, you know, or, or you know, uh, that causes inflammation in the, in the bowel, it's, it's, it's somehow akin to an uh, inflammatory and uh, immune problems as well. That group of patients tend to have higher risk but that's due to the inflammation of the bowel. So it's very different from a systemic uh, autoimmune disorder. Autoimmune. Yes, we don't think that autoimmune disorder is a risk of, of cancer. Okay, thanks, yeah. doctor. Um, Madam, you asked, how do we do immunoscore? Is it through a blood test or through other ways? And if they want to do it, uh, which doctor should they approach? 
Yeah. So this immunoscore is 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 basically on the cancer specimen. So you are not doing on someone who doesn't have cancer. So basically, it's not a blood test. We are looking at the specimen of the cancer, and basically scoring and looking at how many immuno cells you have, the immune cells that is in the vicinity of the cancer. Yeah. So looking at the center of the cancer and the invasive margin of the cancer. So they stain at it and they, are, they actually look at it using some digital software. And then from there, they give a score. So you can't do it on a blood test. Mm, okay. So it's based on the tumor tissues, right? Yes, correct. From yeah. my understanding. Okay. Mm. Um, and they can approach an oncologist to get the immunoscoring done? Yes, of course. They can ask your oncologist about it and that whether is it suitable and whether it's useful for you you know yeah okay uh adrian asks uh he has a client who is diagnosed with colorectal cancer for more than two years already there was no surgery performed and every two or three weeks on chemo and rest for one week before a new cycle again he says his question is very simple uh when will the chemo therapy end because he said the patient says that there is no ending to the chemotherapy so is there seriously no ending to this chemotherapy? So this patient is stage four. Uh, uh, did I get it correctly? I'm guessing, oh, yes. Yeah, it's okay. So the, the thing about this is that when you have a stage four cancer, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to eradicate the disease. You know, it's very simple. It is, it's basically, if you think about it, it's a number game. So let's say you have one cell, uh, you know, or one tumor that is uh, one cubic centimeter. So in that one cubic centimeter, we have about 10 to a power of nine cancer cells. And you can imagine that, you know, if you have a tumor that is five or 10 cm, or if you get tumor everywhere in your liver, you can two, three cm everywhere. You can imagine the number of cancer cells in the body. So no matter what kind of drugs you have, it's very hard to eradicate every single one of them. So of course, there are very fortunate people, you know, probably 5%, we'll say with, with with stage four disease, I mean, in general, about uh, five percent or higher, may have a cure from from stage four disease, but it's very hard to eradicate it. So what we are hoping actually is to convert some of this patient into a chronic disease, and uh, and the way to do it is to give them medicine to suppress the cancer cells so that it will not uh, multiply and overwhelm the system. Mm. All right. So if you stop treatment, it will tend to come back. And uh, then at the time you, you can treat again, this is called a stop and start uh, technique. You give the patient a holiday and then you re-challenge again. But, you know, in, in, in those scenarios, sometimes you are afraid sometimes or so that you may miss the, 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 the window. So sometimes we, we actually do not stop the treatment, but we attenuate the treatment means that we make the treatment lighter so that the patient has less side effects. And then in that period of time, you know, he doesn't have so bad a quality of life for as long as possible. So it means something just an oral medication, okay? And uh, we will only intensify it again if the cancer recurs. So this is unfortunately the reality of things. So it calls to it again, how important it is to detect early mm -hmm. uh, and eradicate the disease before it metastasize. So that was very informative, you know, that uh, basically to answer Adrian's question, his chemo is for life because it's a maintenance, I mean, like to maintain his current lifestyle, right? And his well, life. I mean, yeah, we hope, you hope it continue to work for Aaron. And for all you know, by one day, it may completely disappear. We don't know. I mean, it's uh, cancer yeah. is peculiar. Or one day we have a new drug uh, or it just trigger your immune response and eradicate everything. So we hope for that day. And I, I know that that is the, the reality of this situ uh, current situation. Yeah. Okay, I think there are two more questions. So Jenny Lim asks, uh, can immunoscore be tested on cancer survivors or only tested on current cancer patients? Uh, well, as long as you still have your tissue archive, uh, basically your survival, you have normal cancers, but your tissue archive and is kept in the pathology department, you can retrieve that and test it. Just so like Jenny, yeah, for Jenny, yeah, I would like to tell you, yeah. yeah that I actually got my tumor tested. I'm a survivor. So my tissue block was kept in the pathology with the pathologist and they actually retrieved it for me and got it tested via immunoscore. Uh, Dr. John? 
Um, guys, do you see me? Is Dr. John there? Uh, Dr. John? I think that he got disconnected, guys. Can you all still hear me? I think all of you can still hear me, right? Yeah. So Dr. John has cut off, I believe. I hope he can join back soon because uh, I, yeah. Okay, I see Dr. John again. Sorry, so Dr. John, you were cut off. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have two more questions for you, Dr. John. Sure. Um, sure. So this is regarding Immunoscore by NS Kim. Uh, Hi, Doc. Since data is still being collated, would they consider having volunteer cancer survivors uh, be tested as part of the research in Malaysia? Well, I think the, 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 the thing is that it is, uh, this score is actually uh, validated. So, you know, and uh, ESMO actually, ESMO, which is the European Society of uh, Medical Oncology, it's uh, put it in the guideline as well. So it's not mm -hmm. truly uh, something that uh, it's still in a trial setting. All right. So, it, so therefore, commercially, patients actually has to pay for it. It's actually commercially available now. Uh, we are running a trial uh, for rectal cancer patients. Uh, the, as I told you uh, previously, just to look at whether this immunoscore can uh, predict those patients that if they have a complete response, means that com cancer completely eradicated after radiotherapy, can we use this score to predict that we do not need to do operation for this group of patients? So we are running that 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 trial, uh, which uh, is currently going through our ethics committee to get approval. And uh, in those in that trial, we the the, tr the immunoscore will be given at a sus sus subsidized uh, uh, rate. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much it is, but we're trying to negotiate with a vendor in this group of patients. So uh, that's all we I I, I can uh, tell you in Malaysia. That's what we are doing. But out of that, you know, you probably have to foot the the the, the bill for the any uh, immunoscoring that you would like to do on your own. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. John. Um, if you don't mind, I'll uh, take just one last question. Uh, is there any less invasive chemotherapy treatment for colon cancer? Well, um, well, co the colon cancer, the chemotherapy, and as you know, chemotherapy has been around for many, many years and is still the backbone, unfortunately, for, for colorectal cancer. Um, and most of the time, this drug is actually not very toxic. All right, this uh, call 5 4 uracil that's actually the backbone. And a lot of drugs is developed around that. And of course, we have some other newer agents. So in you know, for, for, for patients with, with stage four disease and all that, there are a lot of new developments looking into the molecular characteristic of the cancer, the mutation of the cancer, and uh, you know, various uh, you know, changes in the cancer that can tell us whether any targeted drug can be used. So there are a lot of drugs available that is less toxic uh, more specific and and, and targeted, uh, even mm. including immunotherapy. Okay, we are talking about immune score, but immunotherapy is using yeah. your harnessing your immune system to attack the cancer. So certain markers in the cancer actually predicts that the patient will respond to immunotherapy. So there are a lot of new developments uh, uh, going on. So I am sure uh, we will probably use less and less chemo uh, in, in the future uh, as we know more and more about the biology of cancer. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. John. Uh, I know that there's one more question that just came in. So uh, I, I think I don't want to take up too much of Dr. John's time. Thank you so much for such an enlightening session, sharing so much about immunoscore and also about colon and rectal cancer and generally how our immune system plays a role in uh, cancer and hopefully prevention. So uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you so much for watching. And thank you IDB for bringing Dr. John on today. IDB Resources for bringing Dr. John and sharing more about Immunoscore. I think this is such groundbreaking uh, scientific uh, method. Also, I'm pretty, like I said, I'm pretty excited to see my uh, score and hopefully I get high <laughs> instead of low. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, it's, it's a good, uh, I would say, 
prognostic tool as well for me. And I'll know how often I get to go for checks. So thank you so much once again. If you have further questions, inquiries, uh, please uh, go ahead and ask Dr. John Lowe at Pantai Hospital KL. Um, and I'm sure he'll be happy to help you. And for those of you, once again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. And I'll see you in two weeks' time on Talking Life with Macy in April. All right, guys? Thank you so much, Dr. John. Thank you, IDB Resources. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank Bye. You. Have a good Sunday. Bye-bye.